So, Jeff, let's talk about this equilibrium, this specific one, which is, by the way, one of the first uh, of the series. This series, Equilibrium, which in a way highlights the substance of the American dream. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a one ball total equilibrium tank. And after making the new, where I'm showing objects for their newness, I wanted to uh, make a body of work that was more biological. And so, you know, they're ready-made objects here. I mean, the basketball's are ready-made. This is an aquarium already made. The, the mounts, I did make the stand myself. But uh, this is an ultimate state of being. Um, just like prior to this, the new was an ultimate state of being, this sense of the eternal through newness. But uh, this is, uh, this is pre-birth. I mean, this is before birth, and it's also uh, after death. And uh, so it, uh, the basketball really reminds me of like an embryo in the womb. And, uh, you know, it's a, a philosophical state. It's uh, uh, it all means, forces are equal. It means that from the very beginning, your work is using metaphors. Uh, it's using metaphor and it loves concept of time, you know, uh, dealing with aspects of the eternal and uh, these ultimate states of being. Uh, uh, this is very much in the moment, but at the same time, you know, uh, it's looking at the, the past and uh, the future. It really deals with vastness. Did, did you talk uh, in the same way about the object when you did it almost 30 years ago? Uh, I spoke exactly like this. I mean, uh, you know, I would have stated that I started working with the basketball to show more of a masculine side of kind of the consumer object, of kind of the ready-made. Uh, but I definitely would have spoke about an ultimate state of being. And I would have spoken about the, the time aspect, the embryo aspect. I mean, everything that uh, we we're just speaking about. And you say that such an object took quite a long time to be realized, that you needed to talk with scientists to get the equilibrium inside. The, I had to work the out the physics uh, to be able to, uh, to achieve the equilibrium. Uh, you know what I think is also interesting, Bernard? If you walk around an equilibrium tank, you'll notice that mirrors occur. Like right now, where I'm looking, the back sheet of glass here, instead of being transparent, it becomes a mirror. True. And so the aspects from the, the earliest work that are in the exhibition, uh, the inflatables that incorporate a mirror, when you move around here, oh, now here, this is a mirror over here. So and in a way, it connects your work to some minimalism and some uh, mirrors and works which uh, were, well, let's say, in the mid-70s have been dealing with this idea of surface reflection and whatever. Absolutely, I think of it as affirmation. I mean, that it really uh, affirms the viewer that everything's dependent on you. Where I'm standing right now, I'm seeing three basketballs. I'm seeing a basketball here, here, and sure. here. So I love that type of abstraction. Let's talk just a little bit about the balloon itself, which refers to the American culture and, uh, well, let's say about what we know about sports as a great expectation for quite a lot of people. Uh, yes, I mean, you know, sports, a lot of times people will use sports as a way for social mobility to be able to change one's... Uh, which it is. Absolutely. And when I was making this body of work too, I was referencing that uh, artists were using uh, art for social mobility, uh, the same way other people have used sports for social mobility. So, and this sense of equilibrium is also dealing with social movement. So, uh, Jeff, uh, here is the rabbit, the stainless uh, steel piece, maybe one of the most iconic works you, you ever did. Let's talk a little bit about the process of making it. Uh, well, the first rabbit, um, you know, I, I bought an inflatable rabbit, and I would have made a silicon mold on the piece. Uh, then that silicon mold uh, would have been filled with uh, wax, and I would have uh, 
have done the lost wax method to, uh, to create the piece. And uh, then we would put a ceramic shell around the wax and uh, would have burned it out and uh, cast the stainless steel into the piece. So you have to realize, I made this in uh, 86. And uh, so to be able to get this type of uh, uh, quality and uh, finish to the works, I had to really push hard. What was the original size of, of the rabbit? Uh, you know, the, the size, same. The same. You know, it's a, it's a ready-made. Uh, uh, it's exactly the size as molded and, you know, there's some shrinkage that happens because it's uh, transformed into stainless steel. But, you know, when I made this piece, what I was really thinking about, uh, Bernard, is uh, trying to tell a new audience of people, because I started showing with Ileana Sonneben, I wanted to give them a history of uh, my involvement with the ready-made. And so, you know, I made that early uh, inflatable rabbit with a flower, the, uh, the bunny and the flower. So, but I also think of the gazing ball, you know, uh, that the head is just like the gazing ball, the lawn ornament that somebody will put in their uh, yard. You had in mind the gazing balls at that time. Absolutely, I mean, this is what I'm referencing. I'm referencing that type of generosity and, uh, you know, the kind of inside, outside, whether something's uh, external, exterior, like a lawn ornament, and also this kind of internal responses that you have to something like this. It's an inflatable, you know, so it's, it's a reference to us uh, human beings. Once again, such uh, an object is dealing, as you said, with ready-made, but it's also dealing with something else, the reflection. So let's talk a bit about the reflection, which will be one of the component of your works. I mean, it's, uh, it's, fun. it's like a GPS system in a way. I mean, it's reflecting everything in its environment. And so it's informing us as much as it can about where we are in the universe. It's saying we're right here in the vastness of the universe. And it's affirming us that when we move the reflection changes, so it's affirming that we're what's important, you know. Whether, you know, the, the saying about like if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, uh, you know, does it fall? This is letting you know that you're important. Uh, everything's happening only because of you, that you're experiencing it. It's about uh, your potential. The art is happening inside you. Nothing's happening there, it's all within you. But if you compare it with the other pieces which uh, belong to statuary. It looks a little bit like a robot. Uh, it looks a little bit that, you know, an abstract figure. And it is the abstract figure in the middle of the other one. Uh, you know, I, I, I look at it and, you know, I think it's iconic because it can mean so many different things. Those little arms, it's like a Venus of Wellendorf there. The carrot to the mouth, I mean, Already. I'm... I feel like an orator standing here talking about the piece. The carrot to the mouth is kind of like an orator. Could be a symbol of masturbation. Uh, the carrot to the mouth, that's kind of very Dali. Uh, or, you know, it could, it's a Playboy bunny. It's a, it's a symbol of resurrection and of Easter. I mean, there's so many different uh, levels and uh, uh, ways of looking at it. But uh, Bernard, I want to go back to, again, Nothing is happening. Nothing is changing on the surface of the piece. The only time it changes when you move to, to the rabbit, that surface is static. The, the room isn't moving, you know. You're moving. Here is Baron Parlisman, which belongs to the Banality series. When did you use this word and why did you use such a word as banality to qualify a piece of art? You know, I, banality comes from uh, a series I showed it in uh, 1988. And I was looking at images that people respond to. I was looking like at Newport ads. I don't know if you know Newport cigarette ads, sure. but the ads would maybe show you know, three people, almost like a menage a trois type thing of maybe a man has a trombone and maybe a woman's balancing a, a, a watermelon on her head and the other woman could be laughing and throwing a party hat up in the air or something. But it's like these banal type images, these dislocated images that people respond to. 
And I was thinking how important it is that people embrace the things that they respond to instead of feeling any guilt and shame about it. And so I started to uh, just think about people's cultural histories and to create a body of work that could have this dialogue about embracing one's past, embracing uh, one's own history, and having this type of acceptance. And then if you do that, then you have a platform to go on and to increase your parameters. So banality is really where I start to articulate this vocabulary. I was trying to tell artists, too, to embrace the tools of communication. I mean, I don't know if you can, I'm sure you sure, remember sure, Bernard, I do. Yeah, yeah. but uh, back, you know, in the, uh, the 80s, we're just coming out of conceptualism and, and minimalism and all this work, the idea to manipulate and seduce, I mean, basically to communicate to people, to try to take people to a certain point, a certain vista, to have a point of view. It's like you, you, you don't manipulate, you don't seduce. It's basically don't use the tools of communication. So I was trying to uh, embrace the tools and tell people, you know, assume the responsibility. Now, what comes along with that responsibility is a morality, the morality to community, well, you know, what you communicate to people. And that's what really Baron Policeman, it, for me, is a symbol of. Which is, which is a wood sculpture, uh, yeah. and which, uh, of course, comes right after statuary. So it's another technique, and it's a popular technique. Also well, it, it, it comes from the church. I mean, the way the church has used wood to uh, let people feel transcendence. You know, it's a living material. It continues to always have movement and move. So I was making reference to the spiritual transcendence that people associate uh, to the church. But here, within the Banality series, you would have had a small little piece like Pupples or amore, these cute little teddy bear type uh, animals that, you know, can grow in to something, uh, grow up into something that can toy with authority. I mean, this is like a Hitler-esque situation. And I'm trying to say, look, I understand if you don't use the tools properly, yes, something can go out of control, can toy with authority. It's basically sexually toying with this bobby here, going to blow its whistle. It's a bi-dimensional image at the beginning, which we transform into 3D sculptures. Uh, yeah, a lot of the source material, nothing is already made in uh, no. the Banality series. It comes, from, it comes from images, or I make different collages, put things together, and uh, created the works for the Banality series. So it was a liberating experience when I made my Kip and Curl that I freed myself uh, from the ready-made. And I realized that it was the public that was the ready-made. It was uh, everything that they came to a work with, what I was interested in. It was their perfections, their imperfections. Uh, you realized that the public was the ready-made. Was the ready-made, that's right. right. I like this statement. <laughs> Jeff, we are in front of maybe one of the most spectacular and famous works you, you ever did, the, the balloon dog, the magenta balloon dog. Uh, I made five different balloon dogs. Uh, each one's unique in its color. Uh, this is magenta. There's a yellow, uh, a blue, an orange, uh, uh, a red. But How do you select the colors? Uh, you know, just what seems kind of natural, looking at the, the spectrum of colors. And uh, I did not do the green, because if it's an outdoor piece, it could get kind of just lost in the, the background if it's just a green environment. But I think one of the reasons that the balloon dog is, uh, is so popular, you know, it deals very much with now. I mean, you look, you see your reflection, it affirms this moment now, it affirms you. And it reminds you of uh, events that happen within your lifetime, a birthday party, uh, uh, different things you can relate to. But at the same time, it's, it's mythic. Uh, it's like a Trojan horse. So you start to go back through time. And you, can, you, know, you get tied back to the Paleolithic and to uh, uh, times where you can understand this could be like a ritual object, something that could have been made out of intestine or something. I mean, it's that type of membrane that it really ties you back to the core 
of uh, what it feels like to be part of a larger community, to be a human being in our history. I, I like what you say when you talk about the Trojan horse. It seems to me that it is definitely your Trojan horse, also in terms of dealing with the institution, with dealing with the museography, everything, you know, it's on the, because of the other size and whatever, this is your Trojan horse. Yeah, even though it's a dog, it's got that equestrian feel. Is it still a dog? Uh, it's called balloon dog, but no, no, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's abstract. It's, uh, it's abstract and it's, it's vast and it goes into a wide area of experience, you know. Uh, the, the, the more connections, the, the more different uh, directions that something can connect to, the more it's in 360 degree, the more it emulates life itself. Once again, you say that it took you quite a lot of years to finalize it. Uh, how many years? Four or five years? Something like that? Well, I started the Balloon Dog in uh, 1994, and I think the first one was finished in 2000. Uh, aspects, making the model, perfecting techniques to be able to create this type of surface, to not to have uh, any imperfections in the form uh, taking place. Uh, we had to develop the tools to do that, but uh, it could have maybe been a little uh, uh, faster. Uh, we ran into some production problems, but uh, uh, you know, certain pieces, they're like other aspects of life. They just take a certain amount of time to be able to present themselves. What do you mean by production problems? Production. Uh, well, just that uh, there was never anything made exactly like this before. So uh, to be able to create these uh, concave uh, shapes and to be able to maintain those reflections, we had to come up with tools. So the production uh, companies would maybe say, oh, look, I can produce it for this amount of money and can do it in this time frame. And then all of a sudden they would contact me and say, you know, we're sorry, but uh, it's going to cost more and it's going to take longer. And then we would get another call saying uh, it's going to take even longer and cost even more. So uh, those type of problems. And uh, uh, it happened because, uh, again, this type of surface uh, wasn't done before. And Balloon Dog is, as you said, also an outside piece. Uh, indoor, outdoor. I mean, I love these works indoor because it emulates more the environment, uh, kind of a spiritual environment you can think of. Uh, when objects are inside, they're even looked at and they're treated uh, more uh, relevant and important to uh, to culture, to society. It's, it's an emblem also of childhood. So it refers to some personal events in your life. Could you talk a bit about that? Well, I, I don't really think so much as personal events other than my references to childhood are usually about the openness that we have. You know, when we're, when we're younger, we don't make judgments about things. We're open to everything. I mean, you, you have a little uh, balloon animal made for you at a birthday party and it's like, wow. And that is as relevant as, you know, the, the horse that could be designed by Bernini or anyone else, that there's no hierarchy. And that if something gives you awe and wonderment and joy, that can't be looked at as having any less value than something that maybe culturally is looked at as a, a high watermark. Uh, it's equal. Uh, there. So Balloon Dog is fighting against criticality? Uh, it's fighting against, uh, yeah, segregation. It's fighting against judgment. Uh, it's embracing acceptance, that everything is perfect in its own being and everything uh, it should remain in play and uh, be absorbed and used and to remove any type of hierarchy. So here is Ballerinas, which belongs to antiquity series. How could you tell that such a piece belongs to an antiquity series? Because to me, it refers to something else, of course. It refers to the ballet, it refers to Degas, it refers to some uh, Russian, as you explained me, some Russian objects which you found. How does it belong to antiquity? Uh, 
The Antiquity series, uh, Bernard, for me, is a, it's a body of work that tries to show that uh, our genes and our DNA are really our, our truest narrative of human history. So the Antiquity series really goes back to like the Paleolithic times, that uh, a piece like Balloon Venus, referencing uh, the Venus of Willendorf. It goes back to the, uh, to the past. It comes up through Praxiteles. It, it uh, will make references to uh, Bernini, Giambologna. It'll go into the Farnese Bull. It goes uh, up, up through time, dealing with the artists past. like the past, uh, up to people like Courbet. I look at the, uh, the ballerinas, and uh, to me, they're, they're Aphrodites. I mean, all of this feminine form that's taking place in the dresses. Uh, you mentioned uh, Degas. Of course, there's the course. history of Degas, but you know, I look at this, and this is a very moist, kind of wet, uh, fluid type of uh, surface. And I think so much of Courbet because of the Venus and Psyche paintings, you know? This interaction between two women and the desire between them. And uh, this one woman is captivated by the other. She's uh, tying her shoe, but you can see the interest. And then uh, the, the standing ballerina makes this gesture with her hands. And in between her hands is, to me, that's uh, something very vast. I mean, it's almost like everything is in that void. But just everything of any kind of uh, relevance, something very, very vast and uh, wide. Something you found and the small object which you got and uh, which, which was the, the step, the first step of uh, you know, uh, this I, piece. I work with ready-mades because it's, it's a way of showing uh, acceptance and that everything's already here in the world. And that, uh, you know, by finding this uh, little uh, uh, porcelain, it was about this big, a Russian mm -hmm. porcelain, you I know, saw it it, it, it's studio. perfect. And, it, you know, if you look at the surface, all of a sudden, if you move around, you'll start to see some of the, the, the uh, perfections, the little imperfections that are in the original porcelain, where the paint, where, uh, where the, let's say, if you look at the, um, the magenta here, the space at the bottom, where somebody originally would have painted this little porcelain with a brush, and it didn't line up just exactly uh, perfect. All these things keep this fluidity in the piece. But you like to keep the imperfection of the original models. Uh, absolutely, because what that's... You cannot erase them. Well, it, because it's... I mean, I'm free. I am absolutely free. I, I, you can I, do it. I, I, yeah. I want to exercise every freedom I can. But I love those uh, uh, imperfections because it continues to tell the viewer that they're perfect, that you know, the uniqueness, the little uh, traits that people have, everything is perfect. They I've are met, perfect. I, I have met some people who say to me that technically it's absolutely gorgeous and spectacular. Uh, you know, I, I, I try to make things that people can just uh, get lost in the abstraction. Sure. This is kind of a, a little new technique, making this kind of a, a pearlescent type of uh, dress where it's completely transparent, but at the same time, it shifts in the color. The shoes and the dress are pearlescent. The other aspects, uh, this is just clear uh, stainless steel down here. You have other transparent colors on the piece, but I think this is a very nice... Uh, could, you, could you explain briefly how you did it? I mean, and specifically about the colors. Uh, well, I, I looked at my original model. Mm -hmm. And uh, the original model has these similar colors, except it wasn't transparent. Uh, and in porcelain. It, it was in uh, white porcelain. But, uh, you know, I just uh, sprayed the transparent coatings on. Like we have the rouge in the cheek, so we would just airbrush that and spray that uh, different color and, and feather that out. But it's really to stay true to the original. It's that, uh, that accepting that it's perfect. I mean, the, this ballerina, her face, the beauty that's there in the original uh, is equivalent to any other image or object of beauty. You could think of Raphael, and this is as beautiful. I don't understand how there could be any hierarchy. Uh, but when you say that it goes back to the original, it means that it is also a celebration of the object itself from where it comes from. 
I think it's a celebration of people. I think it's a celebration of human beings, what it is to uh, have our nature. I think these objects are metaphors. They're, they're uh, things that we can bounce off of to have an own realization about our possibilities, the way we view ourselves and the way we can view ourselves. So there is a big misunderstanding when people talk about kitsch in such a work. It is definitely against kitsch or against what people call kitsch. Yeah, absolutely, because uh, kitsch is a judgment. Uh, sure. Kitsch is a, a hierarchy. Kitsch is saying that something is uh, below some standard. This has nothing to do with kitsch. Kitsch is fetishism. It's, uh, and kitsch is also the taste of the others, as we say. Yeah, I, I don't believe in it. I don't, uh, don't believe in kitsch because I don't believe in judgments. Uh, to me, this is about sublime beauty, just absolute uh, beauty. And uh, everything can be uh, looked at and brought into play and have different significance at different times. And I, I love the reference to Courbet. I mean, this tying, this making direct references to people ties you to human history. It's like having a string and with popcorn and just putting one piece of popcorn on in the next. And one piece of popcorn could be Manet, one could be Courbet, one could be Dali, one could be Titian, one could be Michelangelo. I mean, it's our human history. Uh, it's an art history. It means also that an artist, every artist, you as an artist, is always dealing with art history, is always dealing with what you call the family. But, you know, I think, uh, Bernard, it's a biological history. And it's that, that uh, through our ideas, we can change our genes. That, you know, when, when Manet came into my life, I'm a different person. My genes are different. I have morphed. My genes have transformed themselves. I'm a different human being. And we know in science that that happens. But that can be, you know, science doesn't show that it, that it changes, that your offspring, that your genes have changed. But I think that it's, it's already knowledge in a way that, uh, that we can change that way. I feel it. I feel that, uh, that I'm a different person. I would imagine that uh, my offspring would be different. I do know that I will become in the other art historian or museum director with ballerinas. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you.